Hey, hi, hello, and welcome. I'm Bearmund, and today I'll be giving you a tour of my solo mega base in Don't Starve Together. It's currently day 6650 plus, without any changes to how the world first loaded in with all the bosses and mechanics active. With this said, I should preface that I only recently started putting more weight into decorating, simply because I tend to focus on farming, killing bosses, and automating as much as I can. With that in mind, let's get into it. For me, my main area is my cooking area, my station area, the chest area, and in my case, since I've mostly become a Wanda main, my Wanda highway. I try to keep my chests organized according to the category they fit in, be this an animal product, some stones, burnables, etc. I often adjust this with the patches and the introduction of new items. I made a backup set of chests and again, I tried to organize them according to the categories it fits in. I also made a special boss loot area to better organize the drops. I left a couple chests vacant in case Clay wants to add some more cool bosses. Cool sea bosses, maybe some new moon bosses, I don't know, hint hint. My cooking area is heavily inspired by Jazzy Games, an amazing DST content creator and musician. Please go check him out. Before I watched his video, I more or less didn't care about how the cooking area was organized, but after seeing his multiple videos on how he arranges this area in his base, I felt inspired. I'm also a huge fan of anything culinary and DST has a great array of different foods that you can make. This inspired me to start making the crockpot chests, where I make a bundle of each food available in DST. This is a bit of a hard thing to do, but I'm slowly chipping at it. Also the idea to put signs with the bundling wrap in the chest was a brilliant idea from Jazzy. My Wanda Highway Thank you, Jazzy. allows me to port wherever I want thanks to her clock teleportation. This took a bit of time to do and I'm still adding new clocks to it with every addition to DST. I also add clocks whenever I'm lazy and I don't want to walk because, you know, walking is for noobs with legs. I'll talk more about this later in the video. For my food related farms, first off, let's start with the bees. I put this somewhat far from my main area, but I highly recommend giving your bees some more distance since they tend to get more testy in spring. Nonetheless, I only harvest my honey in winter so that I can avoid them chasing me every time I try to steal from the bastard. I also put flowers near the bees and in between the bee boxes to increase honey production. Again, since I'm not harvesting honey every time they're full, this tends to be mostly for aesthetics and less about guaranteeing that the boxes are full. Onto my crop farming area. I may have made a little too many crop plots, but I like the way it looks. Since this is a very old map, this whole area was filled with advanced farms, and after the improved farm system was implemented, I kept some for aesthetic purposes. To clarify, I did not command console these in. I just kept them where they were before the farm changes happened. I think they look very nice as decorations, and I really wish Clay would bring them back side by side with the new and improved farm crops, if only for aesthetic reasons. I think they have a great place in DST for decor, and even for the occasional crop that you really want to force through growth. For organization purposes, I've been trying to have all my food related areas in one section, so I'm in the process of changing over the stone fruit bushes. Unfortunately, that means I need to farm more stone fruit so I can plant saplings rather than transplant them. For those that might not know this, transplanted stone fruit bushes become barren and need fertilizing while stone fruit bushes that are planted as a sapling will continue to grow in and out of stages without needing fertilizer. I do plan on getting rid of these drying racks as I simply don't need them since I bundle my meat rather than dry it. So once I've accumulated enough stone bush saplings, they will probably be going into this area. Onto the next build in my food section, I have this amazing fish and frog leg farm that I originally saw from Lacknish Monster. If you don't know, this person is amazing at DST and I always tune in to see their next build they make. Go give them a follow. I'll leave their YouTube link down below. The summarized concept of the build allows you to safely farm fish morsels and frog legs to make fish cordon bleu, a Warly specific meal that makes you immune to wetness for 5 minutes in real life time. This meal is perfect for spring or when you want to take advantage of a mob being wet to deal extra damage while not needing to worry about losing sanity and things slipping out of your hand. This build is going to be soon surpassed by Wickerbottom's new books in the new Wickerbottom rework update, but I'll still keep this for aesthetic and backup reasons, and for when I run out of frog's legs from the many frog rains I get. With the Wickerbottom update, I will build a bunch of different farms to mass accumulate fish, but I will keep this area alive to generate frog legs when I need them. If you want to get started on some Wickerbottom builds, please check out JJ who came up with a cool ocean trawler kit farm for fish, and check out Silly SpongeBob DST and Lachnish Monster for their fish farms using cannon kits and or strident tridents. 
Give them all a follow, they really deserve it. Onto my base defense from Hound Waves. I first saw this amazing build from another DST content creator named Sarcodactylus, who is criminally underrated, so please go follow them, link down below. I grabbed their concept and did a little decorative and extra spin on it, but the principle is the same. Their concept, they used Winona Catapults, but since I had an extra Houndius Shootius lying around, I replaced the Catapults with them. To set up this exact system, put up walls in a 6x6 pitchfork length and a 4 wall gap in the middle of each side. It should look like you took out the middle part of each side of a square wall pen. Then, make an inner wall pen with a 1.5 pitchfork distance from the outer walls. But this time, instead of taking out the middle of each side of the pen, you're going to leave out the corners of the pen. Next, you're going to make a statue and walk up to the wall and you'll notice your characters slightly slip into a gap between the wall segments. Once this happens, drop the statue using a chest slottable for perfect placement and continue to place statues like this for every section of the remaining wall. Once you're done, you can attack the wall until it's flattened out. Place five Houndius Shootius in a T formation in the center of the inner pen and you're done. Every time you have a hound wave, just hug the Houndius and wait for them to finish the job. If there's a remaining hound, you can just hit them with a walking cane and the Shootius will take care of them. If you don't want to use Houndia Shootius, you can definitely use Winona Catapults, or if you're still in the beginning stages, you can easily use a 10 by 10 square of teeth traps. The problem with these alternatives is the upkeep, meaning you'll need niter or gems for the catapults, or wood, teeth, and rope to replenish the traps. Regardless, dealing with the hound waves, if you still have them turned on, is a gradual problem that can be solved. Stick in there. Onto my zoo. I don't know why, but even in normal DS, I always loved having pens of different animals that you can find in this game. So I made a pen for the ones that I wanted to have around. First off is the Gecko Pen. If you want some information on this farm build, Blacknish Monster, Jazzy Games, and Helico Puma give great ideas and explanations on how to get this started. Please go check them out. Especially Helico Puma, a content creator that still to this day inspires new people to join DST and will not be forgotten anytime soon. The pen style I opted for was using two salamanders that I teleported from the moon and put them in with the geckos with the furnace in the center to keep them warm and entertained. I can't remember if I saw this build with salamanders from another creator, so if you guys know who it is, leave it in the comments below and I'll credit them. Next, and probably my oldest pen that has suffered a lot of changes over the years, is my bunny pen. Now, I know, this pen looks sad, but it's because I have no use for it anymore this late in the game. This pen first started off as a Jazzy Games bunny farm pen that I'll link down below that I connected to a pen filled with rabbit hutches with a spider den in the middle. Now, this is very useful to me in the early game since I needed silk, monster meat, meat, carrots, and bunny puffs. But with the nerf to the drop rate of loot that you get from bunny men and me slowly not needing any more meat from the world, I retired it and replaced it with monkey tail area, fit for wicker bottoms farm. I did keep the bunny pen with the space in the middle for a spider den if in the near future I need more spider stuff, but the point I am in the game, burning spider glands and feeding excess silk to a lore plant because of the sheer amount this produces over time was generating an obscene amount of lag in my world, I just simply don't see me needing it. But if you're interested in spider farming builds, I highly recommend watching William Hort's video, Dwayne Lacey's video, Paulo Santos' video, or even tuning in to a fellow Tuga of mine stream, Glurms, to check out how they farm spiders. Some use catapults, some use vegan violence. Nonetheless, they're all great creators and you should check them out. My next pen is the No Eyed Deer pen. I had made this pen well over four years ago when I started this world, but a creator named 56CK made a great video in 2021 explaining how to make this. I'll link it down below. This pen is made this way so that I can easily farm antlers all year round. To make this, build a 5x5 pitchfork pen and plant as many trees as you want in the pen. Note that you should avoid using twiggy trees or evergreens since if a deer smashes into them in their old stage, the deer will just simply chop it down. I used palm cones since I like the contrast of winter deers and a summer looking tree. This way, whenever you want an antler, just tap a deer on the bum, and as they run around the pen, they'll smash their heads on the trees and drop their antlers. Another note, however, is that you should leave the pen as soon as you can because the deers will start attacking the wooden walls in order to get away from you. So, just hit them and leave them, then come back and pick up the antlers. Now you might be asking, how did I get them into this pen? Well, you can do it a couple ways, but the way I did 
did it was by placing 9 telelocators in the pen and teleporting them in. Since they spawn so far away sometimes, I found that this was the least, albeit expensive way to do this. Note however, that there is only one herd of 6 to 9 deers in every world at the start of winter, and in order to spawn more, you'll need to kill every member of the herd and wait for the next winter to gather new ones. But since I captured this herd, I never really had to respawn any of the deers, and they're always where I want them. Now I have all the antlers I need to farm Klaus. Next area is the mole worm pen. I started this mostly to keep mole worms somewhere so I can mass produce guacamole for my meal chests, but I ended up getting way more than I thought I could get, not only from the mole worms on the surface, but also from all the ruin clearing I do. I always end up bringing bunnies and mole worms and bundling wraps. Still, I want to decorate this as if it were a quarry to play with the rock theme mole worms have. I'm still trying to figure out a way to get the boulders in here without using console commands. Near the mole worms, I have the OG, very first ever vault goat herd that this world generated. When I started this world, vault goats weren't renewable, so I did everything in my power to preserve them and move them very slowly across the entire map, taking me five in-game days to do it. I was determined to preserve these goats though. Now that they're a renewable mob, when you follow a suspicious dirt pile during spring rains in the oasis desert, I keep this herd as a memento of the struggle it was to farm vault goats back in the day. Next section of the zoo are my suspicious dirt pile pens, the qualifants, and the uicus. Now, these pens are purely for aesthetics since we can't shave or domesticate these beasts yet, but I like having them here and hearing their little snores when they sleep. Couple of notes, I got them here the same way I got the deers in their pen, by telelocation, but since the uicus are not the nicest of beasts, I put them to sleep first, then telelocate them into the pen. When I need to refuel the telelocating in the pen, I simply put them all to sleep, refuel, and run. Another note, Ilicus will still try to snot you if you walk too close to their pen, but as long as you're not too close for too long, it shouldn't be an issue. The most recent addition to the zoo was the grass gator pen, that honestly will fill any twig needs you may have. To get this, similar to the qualifants, I simply went to multiple waterlogged biomes and telelocated them into the pen. If you really want to make this a twig farm, I recommend putting something that scares them in the middle of the pen, similar to the salad manders I put in the grass gecko pen. If I'm to say anything about this is that I really wish grass gators dropped at least one grass along with the twigs they drop. Seems like a little bit of a missed opportunity to call them grass gators and have them only drop twigs. I definitely do plan on expanding my zoo with slurpers, some rock lobsters, and some other creatures, but that's a future endeavor. Next section in my base is my event area. Now this is a relatively new addition here since I recently turned them all on in an attempt to get into decorating more, rather than just focusing on boss killing. The sections that I think are finished are my carnival festival area and my year of the beefalo area. I tried to decorate it to look like an actual carnival that you can walk through and play games while incorporating the year of the cat coon event into it. Look at the kitties, it's like a petting zoo for cats. Anywho, I think it looks good since this is the first and only place I've legitimately spent time decorating. Beefalo event is basically an area where I can play around with the NPCs. It's honestly a very fun event since I find my beefalo named Beefy to be the most adorable thing to cross the constant, and I love that I get to play around with beefalo cuteness whenever I want. The most recent area that I'm trying to build is this Year of the Carat event. Currently, I've built a gym and an area where I can test out a couple of builds that I want to make. What I've settled on is making a rat maze lined with checkpoints so I can watch the rats run to the finish line, but I haven't finished this build yet to settle some of the kinks out. Maybe I'll make a follow up video of this if you guys want it. And the last and most useful year of the event is the Pig King. Now, before I had this set up, I had all my trinkets surrounding the Pig King, but I recently changed it so that I can build this little arena to farm lucky golden nuggets. If you want an in-depth view of this in action, I highly recommend you check out Lachnish Monsters build. Again, this person is a genius in DST. Go check them out. Oh, and while you're there, check out their awesome ticket farming method for the carnival of Event that I totally didn't use on my base. <clears throat> well, anyway, it's honestly worth the watch. Links in the description. For other cool Year of the Pig King builds, check out Hugi DST on their interpretation of this farm. Links down below. I do plan on making a massive bush area to celebrate the Year of the Gobbler, but that's currently under construction. Another section near my base is the massive lure plant collection. Whenever I need a fast meal or some leafy meat for specific meals for my meal chests, I come here. 
collect them all, and wait a day or two until they replenish. Honestly, I didn't know what else to do with my lore plants since I have so many, so I made a makeshift meat farm area here. Nothing out of this world, it's not like I have too many of them or anything. <laughs> Another build on the outskirts of my base is the Shadow Clockwork Farm. Now, this farm used to be a copy of Bunjamin's build, I'll link down below, but with the new introduction of docks, I made some adjustments. I replaced the boats with docks that I formed in a hook and put catapults on the docks nearest to the coast to make mimic the boats I formerly had here. I made it in a hook shape and put a wall and door at the beginning of the hall in order for the rooks that I spawned to not just simply follow me down the docks and knock me the hell out. I totally didn't learn this the hard way. <laughs> Anyway, quick rundown of what to do to farm these bosses, if this is new to you, is you make as many knight statues as you can on the coast side of the build. Then, on the catapult docks, you make one rook and one bishop. During the new moon, close the damn door first. Hammer one knight statue, teleport to the catapult, and hammer the rook statue. Fight the bishop and the rook like normal, and now the knights are in full tier 3 phase. Turn the catapults on and wait. I use this build mostly to farm nightmare fuel easily every new moon phase, and I just feed the excess hearts to a lore plant. If I'm ever in a pinch for nightmare fuel, I decon the night armor. Super easy, super simple. It's also a great way to get papyrus. An adjustment I made to the hook dock was that I implemented a fishing area for Wickerbottom's new books. Again, I want to make multiple little builds to use her books. Even if I don't use them, I still like them for the aesthetics. Onto the bottom of my base. I made character specific zones for each character in the game for both storage area for character specific items and for the laws of it. So starting with Wilson's area. I wanted to make a mad scientist area with bunnies and new crust of shines to make it seem like he's using them for his mad experiments. But I definitely want to revisit this area and decorate it more with the mad scientist lab and some other wacky stuff. Next is Willow's area. Now I made this area so that no matter where you're standing in this 5x5 area, you're always being warmed up. If you want intense heat, you can turn on the fire pits and your temperatures rise very fast. I think this area is more or less done, however I do want to add walls and fire nettles as decoration. More heat the better, and I want to put more burnies and lighters. Next, Wolfgang. I made this gym system right after his rework was out, so I didn't decorate it much, but I do want to make a dumbbell rack type design around the different gyms and put some overgrown potatoes in here. This one is definitely one that needs more attention. Next is Wendy. Now, I wanted this area in the actual cemetery of the world, but since it's smack in the middle of the meteor fields, I had to settle with this. I will however try to decorate the cemetery as best as I can, but I feel like it's going to be in vain with every meteor shower destroying whatever I build. We'll see. Nonetheless, I made a simple cistern with glow caps and chests for Abigail's different cocktails. If I'm being honest, now that bananas are an obtainable plant, I might redecorate this with bananas and stone walls with the Victorian skin to make this feel more like Wendy. Next is the WX-78. The reason why this is barely decorated is because I've been trying very hard to get fixed clockworks up in this area. After a lot of struggle and after WX's rework, I kinda gave up, but I plan on making a bunch of chests for his new circuits. If you guys know any way to get clockworks up from the ruins onto the mainland without using commands, please let me know. Next is Wickerbottom. I was in the process of making this area for her, with different turfs and sections relating to each book she has, but since her rework was announced, I kinda put this on standby. I do have plans to triple this area for her various books and move the other character specific areas somewhere else just to give her some more space. Next is Woody. This is one of the areas that needs a rework, and with the wicker bottom area expanding, I'm going to have to move Woody to another area where I can have some more space to build something that properly represents him. I do plan on implementing cisterns and some different shrines from the events to decorate his area. Think place of worship meets ancient ruins for his different transformations. Next up is Wes. Now, for the most OP character that definitely needs a nerf in this game, pause for sarcasm, I made a silly and small area for him since he doesn't have much that represents him. I don't plan on altering this area since I think it suits him. Next, Maxwell. Now, this is another one that's on standby. Hopefully he gets a rework soon. Nonetheless, I tried to implement suspicious moon rocks into the build and try to make it dark to better represent him, but I'm going to tear it down and start fresh. If you guys have any ideas, let me know down below. I did check out Mustard Tiger's Spooky Kitchen Quick Build video. I might take some inspiration from that. Links down below, check it out, and give him a follow. Next, Wigfrid. I tried making an arena type area for her and her songs, scattered some spears along the battlefield, but 
I think I'm going to incorporate the skeletons of every character in the game into this area, and maybe some suspicious moon rocks of werepigs to add a sense of battle here. So, if you see me on Twitch dying multiple times, just know it's for the sake of art, and I didn't lose my mind. Well, maybe a little. Weber. Unfortunately, I have built and destroyed Weber's area many a times because I haven't really nailed what I want to do for him. However, I did want to make an area for every spider in the game, similar to how Jakeosaurus did on his Weber run. Go check him out, links down below. If you guys have any ideas, please let me know. Winona. Now for her, I wanted to make a factory type setup and decorate it with spider farms and such, but considering I don't want to lag out my system with dead spiders, I'm trying to think of something else that would go well here. Still, so, this is where I left off last time I was decorating this area. I do plan on putting more elements to this, but I'm open to suggestions. Barley. Now, he has two main areas. The cooking area, that is incorporated into the fish cordon blue build I mentioned, and a kitchen just for him, that I recently made near my main area. I do want to doll it up like I did with my main kitchen, and transfer his chef meals chests over here. I will say, Whirly is truly one of my favorite characters, and is one that I often go back to, not only for spiced food and Volco jelly, but also to make my meal chests full. I just find it appropriate that I fill the chests up using him. Anyways, that's a little side note. I can't wait to see Clay give the best chef in the world some more new spices and meals. Hopefully soon. Walter. Now, this is another character that I like for RP reasons since he gives so much of it. So, for his area, I wanted it to be a camping site with different elements that he brings. The chests with the different ammo types he has, the small forest that unfortunately got petrified, and the tents and the campfire that he loves so much. He's honestly a character that I really want an update on. I've been working on a video about him, so if you want to hear my opinion, stay tuned. On to Wartox. Now this is another character that I have a lot of ideas on to improve him, not only in giving him some structures to better utilize him, but also to make him a more approachable character for people to choose. Still, because he doesn't have much, I decorate it with some extra Krampus sacks I had with the different skins, outlined with flowers for easy soul harvesting. I do want to add some bee mines and maybe some bundled bees for some extra easy ways to get souls, since I can't store them any other way. Maybe even some imprisonment cramp by? Who knows? Next up, Wormwood. This area's theme is plants, plants, and you guessed it, plants. I decorated this with some of the items specific to him, but I do want to implement more thulacite walls with skins that resemble the pig temples from Hamlet to add some more depth to this area. Maybe even some giant versions of some crops. Soon. Soon, my sweet Wormwood. Next up is Wart. Now for her, I wanted to make something very special and very time consuming. I wanted to turn the entire swamp into a merm city, decorated with monkey tails, petting zoos of tentacles, and a variety of trees and a proper castle for the king. Because this is going to take so long and because this is a solo world, it's going to be a while until we see Wart properly represented in this world, but still, she has great plans for her future. Last but not least, Wanda. This character, like many other content creators, is my main. Simply because in a mega base, you can pass off instant teleportation and high damage. So for her specific area, I made her a Wanda Highway. Jazzy Games does a great job at explaining how to set this up, so go check out that video. Link down below. But to summarize it, you basically put a clock on each side of where you want to go and click to activate the backtrack watch in the chest and bam, you're there. I've done this to every area I want to be, whether it's a minor thing like salt formation area to big things like like the dragonfly area. This highway is the most used place in my base. One of the last things I want to show are some things that I've built that are external to my main mega base area. Starting off with the Mac Tusk camps. I've recently built some walls around each camp. Luckily, I was blessed with four camps in this world. So, I used the backtrack watch that are synced in a loop between each camp to make killing Mac Tusk quick while making sure him and his hounds don't run away. I do plan on making this area surrounded by statues, similar to the houndiest, shootiest area. Since I don't turn off any main feature of DST on this mega base, I put two bunny man huts around every sinkhole. This way, I have some entertainment whenever a bat comes out, since bunnies and bats are sworn enemies since the dawn of time. Next is the Varg area. Now, this was heavily inspired by Gabriel Gabriel's many many videos that they've done with Vargs and the Moon Rock. I'll link them down below. Go check them out. He's also a super nice person. If you ever catch one of his streams, it's super chill. As for this farm, I'm not happy with the way I have set it up, so I'll be reworking it soon. Give the Varg some more space between them and make the catapults area less cramp. Next is my summer base. This has been the biggest struggle for me to fix, since I've started this as a simple place to be during the summer, but it slowly progressed into a base that I wanted to expand on, so things are messy at the moment. 
Still, the main features of this base is expansive crop farm area where I mass produce peppers, onions, dragon fruits, and garlic during the summer, the multiple volt goat pens, the antlion arena, and the knobbly tree nuts surrounding the outskirts of the oasis. Again, all these areas are only worked on during the summer, so things look a lot worse when compared to my main base. Still, a big thing I'm proud of is my bridge to the moon. I built this on stream and I honestly love the way it looks. I was blessed with the C-shaped world four years ago when I started this world, and now with the introduction of docks, it's a blessing in disguise. I plan on making the other side of the bridge look just like this. Onto the moon! I've built a very loosely described base here, but once I realized that I hadn't finished my main base, let alone my summer base, I put this one on hold. Still, I made this next to the Celestial Champion Arena. Now before you tell me, I know, Cobblestone doesn't help the second phase, but it most certainly helps the other two phases, so I highly recommend if you have the time to build a Cobblestone Arena for the Celestial Champion, please do it. Other Moonly builds is the Splorange Bird Farm that I'll link down below. If you ever want to farm feathers of any bird in the constant, this is the way to do it. This basically uses the Birds of the World book from Wickerbottom with a splash of mass bird murder. Get it? Cause a group of crows? Uh, yeah. Anyway, please go check out Splorange. They are another criminally underrated DST content creator. Next to this is the mandatory Wickerbottom Grass and Twig Farm. Since I now have grass caters and a gecko pen, I don't use this farm very often them, but when I'm doing something that involves a lot of rope, I do swap to Wicker Bottom and get as much as I can. On another island of the moon, I have Berger's area. He is my favorite boss for multiple reasons, but more importantly, look at him. He's so adorable. For that reason, I keep him nice and safe here. Whenever I need him, I teleport him to a birch nut forest or a petrified forest whenever I need a large amount of resources during autumn. But yeah, he just stays here and sleeps until I need him. Another recent addition to my moon is the Tree Guard Island that I plan on decorating with pig houses and some forest items. Imagine this, a pig village from Hamlet was aggressively invaded by tree guards. Yeah, that's the theme. Last but not least is my defense when I'm on the moon. This is still under development and just makes it easier for when I'm stranded on the moon during a hound attack. Now onto the areas I tend to spend the most time on boss areas. I do plan on decorating them and making them more thematic to the combat area, but here's how I farm most of the bosses that drop useful items for me. Starting off with Klaus. Ever since Clay made it available to play the Winter's Feast whenever you want, I've been farming Klaus every 20 days. Something you might have noticed in my maps is that I have a lot of Occu Vigils throughout the Deciduous and Mosaic biomes. This is because if you put a structure over the spawn point of Klaus's sack, it will never consider that a spawn point until the structure is removed. Unfortunately for me, I decided to build my main base in the Pig King's Deciduous biome, meaning there were a lot of spawn point locations for his sack. So, once I found them all, I left one point that was safely outside of my base and made a small arena around his sack. Now, every time Klaus is off cooldown, I teleport to his arena and take him down. I don't automate Klaus because I find the fight to be very easy, so I haven't dedicated any time into automating a process for a fight that takes under two minutes to finish. The items I use for this fight are spiced food, chili and garlic powder. I use jelly beans because they don't spoil and I can just leave them in the chest. Also, I have an excellent of them, so this was the only thing I could think of to use them all. I also use Volco Jelly, a Thulicide Crown, and a Magna Luminescence. Next up is Dragonfly. For this fight, I use two Bone Armors and the Enlightened Crown, along with Vault Goat Jelly, Spiced Jelly Beans, and Ice Cream or Soothing Tea. So whenever she swings at me, I swap to the other Bone Armor. For those that don't know, each Bone Armor is on a 5 second cooldown on its blocking 1 instance of damage feature, meaning you can swap between 2 or more Bone Armors as long as the damage incoming doesn't surpass the 5 second cooldown to completely avoid all the damage. So with that, I tank the Dragonfly using this method, and I use the Enlightened Crown to output some more damage. Again, for those that don't know, the Crown casts the Gestalt at the target that deals 42.5 damage while your sanity is above 85%. While I'm tanking her, and when my sanity drops below the threshold, I use an Ice Cream or I use Soothing Tea, the first being for a quick burst of sanity regen while the latter provides sanity over time while I'm fighting. Ultimately, both of these foods are here to provide some extra damage while I'm tanking her. Using this method, the fight tends to take under two minutes. Onto the Bee Queen. I use the Wicker Bottoms method that I first saw through Don Gianni's build. I'll link this in the description below. Don is another amazing DST content creator, so give them a follow. However, my adaptation of their build involves an inverse of the area they created in their video. In my build, I left one pitchfork of distance on each side of the hive vacant 
and I filled 2.5 pitchforks of distance after that with flattened stone walls. This ultimately creates a small area that I can summon and compact tentacles where the Bee Queen spawns. This method sure kills the Bee Queen fast, but it's a little dangerous to spawn her since you need to hammer the hive several times to get her out. I use a Bee Queen crown and a Magna Luminescence to make the hammering faster and avoid the swings of the tentacles. If you don't like this build, I'll leave Lachnus Monsters Winona Catapult build and Cat Person's Solo Guide to Killing the Bee Queen build in the description down below if you want to do it a different way. Again, please check out all the content creators I've mentioned in this video. Another boss I farm for the Enlightened Crown Fragments for my glow caps is the Celestial Champion. I know I already showed the arena, but there are some tips that might help newcomers to farm it. If you want to complete Wagstaff's event and farm Refrain Statics, a key element into summoning the Celestial Champion, I highly recommend changing to Wendy, since Abigail in Riled Up mode will automatically kill the crows that spawn while you're helping Wagstaff. If this isn't a way you want to do it, I also recommend getting two bunny men and giving them some headgear while you're helping Wagstaff. This way, the bunnies will act similar to Abigail and kill the crows for you. Still want another farming method? Bring three weather panes with you and kill the horde of crows this way. Regardless of the method you use, always bring a gold pickaxe and a bug net with you to mine the moon shards and capture the moon gleams that spawn from the storm. Once you have at least 3 refrain statics, 20 moon gleams, and 30 moon shards, you can go back to the moon and kill the celestial champion. If you guys want a guide on any of these fights, leave a comment down below and I'll happily help you out. Last two bosses I commonly kill are the Ancient Guardian and the Ancient Fuel Weaver, both of which I have automated. So for the Ancient Guardian, I put one anemone on his spawn point that snaps at him every one minute. Since I only clear the runes in summertime, by the time he lasts spawn until the next summer, the Ancient Guardian is already dead, and all I have to do is pick up the loot. For the Ancient Fuel Weaver, I use Elit's Build Guide that I'll link down below. In summary, I block Fuel Weaver's path with lure plants, put the key in the gateway, and once the Houndiest Shootiest have target the Fuel Weaver, I telepoof out of the arena. Since I'm no longer in the arena, Fuel Weaver will attempt to walk back to the gateway, only to be stopped by my lure plants. Then, it's just a waiting game until the Houndiest Shootiest kill him. I do have a crappy ruins base, but it's been put on hold just like the moon base, so I won't get into it. Honestly, no one that has ever started a mega base can say that they came up with everything by themselves or have never looked at other DST content creators for inspiration. I'm so happy that I not only get to create content for games that I genuinely love, like Don't Starve, but that I also have this opportunity, even if it's my first video, to shout out all these amazing content creators. At the end of the day, if just one person falls in love with DST because of this video or because of any of the creators I mentioned, I know I did what I needed to do. With that said, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please consider subscribing, following my social medias, and if you want to see me live, follow me on Twitch. Again, please go check out all the people I mentioned. They all deserve a follow. Goodbye everyone, have a great day, and don't forget to wash your hands.